Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Can we lift our hands to Jesus, please? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. When we embrace your love, we embrace your power. We embrace your goodness. We embrace your faithfulness. Thank you for loving us. Even when we were not worth it, you reached down and you loved us. All we can do is thank you and love you back in return. So this morning we say, Lord Jesus, we love you. We adore you. We magnify your holy and majestic name. Who is like unto you, O God? There is no God that loves like you. You love from the little details to the big issues. Your love envelopes us, encompasses us encourages us, takes care of everything. Thank you for loving us, Jesus. Thank you for changing us with your love. Thank you for hearts that have been healed this morning. Hearts that have been reassured that you love them. Thank you for identities that have been restored already this morning. Thank you for bodies that have embraced your power, even as they embraced your love. Thank you for changes and shiftings that have occurred in the supernatural realm, even as we embraced your love. What a mighty and awesome God you are. Your people lift their hands to you. In the sanctuary, we lift our hands to you. In our worship, we lift our hands to you. With the confidence of a people who are loved by a loving Father, people who are favored who the Father is partial towards, we lift our hands to you. And we say thank you for loving us, Jesus. We give you praise. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands to Jesus? God wants you to know that his love towards you is not a feeling. God wants you to know that his love towards you is a commitment. God wants you to know that he can't feel any other way towards you but love. I'll say it again. He cannot feel any other way towards you but love. Somebody needs to get a revelation of the love of God this morning. God is incapable of not loving you. God is not able to do anything other than love you. God cannot hate you. God cannot dislike you. God cannot even be tempted to hate you. It means there is nothing, absolutely nothing you will do that will make God stop loving you. There is absolutely nothing you will do that will change the love of God towards you. For anything able to change the love of God towards you has established itself as something that can change the very nature of God. And there is nothing created by God and all things were created by him that can change the eternal existence and nature of God. God cannot love you any other way but the way he loves you. It's a commitment. It's his nature. And that nature is what he's given to us. Therefore, we can also love God. And be committed to him. But get the revelation this morning. That God cannot but love you. It is impossible. The way it is impossible for God to lie. Is the same way it is impossible for God not to love you. It is impossible. There is nothing you will do. Ever. That will make God stop loving you. When you know that, then you will truly embrace the love of God in its full package with nothing left. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I now get into my message, Lord? Will you let me preach? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If we have the same love, does it therefore mean that there is nothing anybody can do towards us that will make us stop loving? Now it gets tough. If it is the same love we have, does it therefore mean 
except it's an inferior kind of love. But my Bible tells me that the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. And there's nothing the Holy Ghost does that is not superior and excellent. So if it is the same love of God that loves us as a commitment, regardless of what we've done, that is in our hearts, then does it therefore mean that there is nothing anybody will do towards you that will make you someone who does not love? Can you love a father who rapes you? Is it possible? Can you love a best friend who deceives you? Is it possible? What then is this love? Is it a feeling? Is it a commitment and a decision? Will your walking out of love and walking in offense and unforgiveness change your nature? Is it worth trading who God has called you? So how can we therefore walk in this love? The only way we can do it is by first of all embracing the source of that love. Because when you do that, then you embrace your identity. And regardless, you can love. I hear God's spirit say, God, say love is a power, it's a force, it's an anchor. In these last days, the love of God will get you through tough situations. In these last days, the love of God will confound the enemy. For the love of God acts contrary to the enemy's expectations. And so when the enemy sets you up for failure, you confound him with the love of God. When the enemy positions you for poison and offense, you confuse him with the love of God. But that same love of God is a defense. It protects you. It keeps you from harm. So in loving, you really cannot be hurt where it matters most. Because where that love is deposited is impenetrable. That is the revelation of the love of God. It is not a feeling. It is not a bunch of emotions. It is a commitment. It is an expression of a kind of nature, who God is and who he has made us. Therefore, this love cannot be understood by the human mind and by comprehension. It can only be understood by revelation of who God is. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Your battles of faith are weakened by the lack of the love of God in your life. For faith works by love. So many times there's an effort of faith. There are confessions being made. There are seeds being sown. But there is no anchor of the love of God that is a commitment. That is who we are. It is not understood by the human mind. It is received by a renewed mind that has revelation knowledge. When I hug you, I love you. When I chastise you, I love you. When I direct you, I love you. When I discipline you, I love you. When I counsel with you, I love you. When I console you, I love you. 
That is the love of God. A commitment to keep you in the plans, purposes, and nature of God for your life. Once we get the revelation of who God is, then we can get a revelation of who we are. And a lot of our battles will be won faster, easier, when we can truly walk in this commitment that is the love of God. Lift your hands and give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. Indeed, we have freedom. Freedom to walk in love because of your love. Freedom to forgive because of your love. Freedom to see the best in others. The way God's love saw the best in us. Thank you for loving us, Jesus. Thank you for loving us, Jesus. Because of your love, we're free. Thank you for loving us, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Can you give someone a love smile? See Tyre and Spence after I got born number five. That was a romantic smile. Give them an agape love of God smile. Tell me, Pastor, what's the difference? I don't know. Okay, let's try this. Give them a love hug. No squeezing, no squeezing and pressing. Anybody press you here, break them. <laughs> I will press them with the love of God. <laughs> Glory be to God. The blessing, the evidence of his presence, part 10. All right, let's get to see how much we can do today. Um, very quick reviews as usual. Review, presence of someone is an embodiment of what that person stands for. We describe presence, evidence. I won't do this too much because of time. We describe blessing. Um, we looked at several things. An encounter with God's presence. A departure from God's presence. And so on and so forth. Um, a man with God's presence. We got into the blessing. Now, where are we? What H and what is H? H is the relevance of the blessing. Everybody said the, the relevance of the blessing. The first thing we looked at was the blessing separates you. We looked at that thoroughly. And today, we continue from what we started last week, which was the blessing and the. How many of us got some? Revelation last week on the tithe. Praise God. So what principle did we say the tithe is hinged on? I can't hear you. The owner steward principle. The owner steward principle. And we said several things about the tithe. The first thing we said was the tithe is... Second thing, the tithe is a timeless principle. We looked at three places so far where we saw the tithe mentioned directly or insinuated. The first place was the Garden of Eden. Second example was Abraham. And who was with him? Huh? Melchizedek. And the third was who? Jacob the Cunningham. So today we're going to get into the law. So now we're looking at the tithe. Still is a timeless principle. Let's look at the tithe in the law. And we have several scriptures to read. There are a lot of scriptures in today's teaching. So, but please, when, he, when it's being read, I'll show you the parts I want you to highlight. 
Deuteronomy 12, 5 to 6. Um, Pastor, do you have a mic now? Yeah. Can you give me Deuteronomy 12, 5 to 6? Deuteronomy 12, 5. But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. And there you shall go. Six. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your, your tithes, tithes. Uh -huh. the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. You see there you take your tithes. We're looking at tithing in the law, under the law of Moses. But we have seen, I believe, that even before the law, tithing was practiced. Have we seen and proved that thoroughly? Yeah. All right. No, Numbers 18, 21, 27. Let's read 21. Okay, let's read the whole thing. 21, 27. Numbers 18, 21. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak thus to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. And your heave offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and as a fullness of the wine press. So who were the tithe given to? Why was it given to them? Huh? I can't hear you. Because they did the work and they're the ones that ministered in the tabernacle of meeting and the rest of Israel was not supposed to go there. Okay, what's the next scripture? Uh, where are we now? N Did I see Nehemiah 10? Let me be sure I've got the right scripture. Nehemiah 10, 35 to 39. Can you just read 37 and 38? Nehemiah 10, 37. To bring the first fruits of our dough, our offering, the fruits from all kinds of trees, the new wine and oil to the priests, to the storerooms of the house of our God, and to bring the tithes of our lands to the Levites, for the Levites should receive the tithes in all of our farming communities. And the priest, the descendant of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes. And the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes, to the house of our God, to the store, to the rooms of the storehouse. All right, again, we see the same thing. But I think we should also read verse 39, for because of the last part. For the children of Israel and children of Levi, 39. Yeah. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain, of the new wine and the oil, to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are, and we will not neglect the house of our God. We will not neglect the house of our God. Do you see one of the reasons why the tithe was brought? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Hebrews 7, 5. Hebrews 7, 5. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. All right, so we see here that the Lord did not introduce the tithe, did it? Huh? But did the Lord do away with it? Huh? So 
So the law continued with the tithe. Okay. Do you know that under the law, if you didn't tithe, you had to like pay 20% on top of what you didn't tithe to like pay back or some kind of penalty. So obviously there was some seriousness with tithing under the law. Is that true? Why was something that was originally introduced to be a blessing now made a mandatory requirement under the law? Do you see a difference in which, in the way in which we saw tithing earlier, right to the way we're seeing tithing now in the law? It's a commandment. You must do this. If you don't do it, you're going to pay 20% extra. You know, kind of like rough, rough stuff. Same principle, nothing has changed. Continued with, but it seems now it's more mandatory. You know, if you don't do this, and these are the Levites, and you must give it to them, and you better give it to them, or otherwise you pay extra. So what, what brought in this? What do you think? Because sometimes when you read the Bible, you've got to let the Holy Spirit minister to you. What do you think but about this mandatory component, which is what we see introduced now in the way the tithe? Is being practiced under the law. It didn't start under the law. But there seems to be some commandment, co- uh, obedience required from you, almost like by force, better do it or else, principle brought in here. Do you see that, first of all? W- why do you think? Nobody seems to be emphasizing the honesty word principle like that here anymore so obviously that that component was brought in why do you think it was brought in think okay let's read something now i help you let's read some clues galatians 3 24 that's going to go up because i'm going to read it from We're going to read from four different translations, from the New King James, from the God's Word, from the ICB, and from the Phillips translation. I have them up so so that we can read them. Galatians 3.24. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Can you put up the slide where the other versions are, please? That will help me. Thank you. The God's Word version. Before Christ came, listen, we're asking ourselves why this component has been brought in. Before Christ came, Moses' law served as our guardian. Christ came so that we could receive God's approval by faith. We read in the King James, it was our tutor. I think the King James says schoolmaster. The ICB says, so the law was our master until Christ came. After Christ came, we could be made right with God through faith. Galatians 3.24, Phillips. Before the coming of faith, we were all imprisoned under the power of the law. With our only hope of deliverance, the faith that was to be shown to us. Or to change the metaphor, the law was like a strict governess in charge of us until we went to the school of Christ and learned to be justified by faith in him. Once we had that faith, we were completely free from the governess's authority. Again, why do you think the law was brought in? And that component was brought in. Anybody can tell me? Having gotten these clues from the scripture? Take a guess. Yes? I can't hear. I can't see the person. Show me your hand. What did you say, please? To guide us. Good. Guide us where? You're right. To guide us where? To the blessing, good. But to guide us in what way? Back to what? We saw Abraham pay tithe. How did he pay it? By? By? 
So the law was there to guide us back to, or like we read, to point us back to faith. So does it mean that between the beginning and that time the law came in, could it be that some people had begun to drift from faith? Do you have some examples? We looked at them last week. Remember we looked, Jacob, was that faith? It was the complete opposite of faith. Jacob said, I will tithe if you bless me. Is that faith? Did you see Cain and Abel? Remember we learned that what Cain did, what Abel did was the first fruit, so we could see the same tithe principle there, and God was pleased with Abel's first fruit, but both gave a tithe, both gave offerings rather. But Abel's was called the first fruit, and that pleased God. Abel gave it by faith. Cain did not. So could it be the likes of people through the generations? For it to say, point us back to faith. It means we began doing this thing by faith, slipped up somewhere along the line, and then we needed a teacher, a governess. Do this or else. I'm going to take you this way till you get to the school of Christ, where you learn that you can only be justified by faith and the law itself cannot justify you. Did you get that, church? So what did the law really bring in where tithing was concerned? Did it introduce tithing? Did it do away with tithing? What did it do? Huh? Made it stricter. Made it mandatory. Made it enforced it, made it a way you've got to learn that this is what God, we embrace his love. If you love me, you keep my commandments. So when you were singing and crying this morning, I embrace his love, you were saying, I embrace your commandments. Or unembrace that love. If you embrace his love, you embrace his commandments. You can't say you love me and you don't do what I say. So tithing was there to make you understand that, look, if God expects you to do something, then do it. But since you refuse to do it by faith, do it or else. The Lord was a schoolmaster to point us back. Because let me tell you what happens. When you try and do it by the law, you get so frustrated, you eventually give up and surrender. Because there is no man alive who can keep every part of the law. How many will you keep? So it keeps showing you that you can't do this by your strength. The only way you can do it is by faith. And a lot of believers pay their tithe like they're under the law. A lot of you sitting here and you will be liberated as you began to be liberated last week. You pay your tithe like one under the law. You pay out of fear, obligation, or else. If I don't pay, I will die. You won't die. Just will show that you don't respect the possessor, the owner. You'll be like a steward trying to assume the position of the landlord. You've got to be free to do what you do with liberation, knowing why you do it. You are no longer under the law. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Let's go. Let me show you a few more things. So the Lord was to point us back to faith. It was a tutor. So, it didn't bring a new concept. Listen, write this down if it's not there on the, on the, on the screen. The law was not there to introduce the tithe as a new concept. But to train people to see the necessity to develop faith in a God the law was not there to introduce the tithe as a new concept. but to train people 
to see the necessity to develop faith in a God who could give an inheritance to a whole tribe this way. The whole tribe of Levi. They had no land, no property, but what they had from the tithe was more than enough. Hebrews 7, 18, Colossians 2, 14. So what then happened after the law? What did Christ then do? Let's read and understand exactly what was taken out. Because the argument of a lot of people against the tithing is that it ended with the law. We're showing that tithe is a timeless principle. It began before the law. Something was introduced during the law. But we're going to find out it continued even after. And what exactly was Christ's business with the tithe in the law? Did he remove it completely? What did he do? Let's look at Hebrews 7, 18. Hebrews 7, 18. For on the one hand, there is an, there is an annulling. Say of annulling, the, everybody. Uh-huh, sorry. Of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. 19. For the law made, you don't have 19? For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in, everybody say bringing in, of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So the law was weak, it was unprofitable, but it brought in something better. And that something better it brought in was a way of faith. Everything you do with God, he expects you to do it by faith, or he's not interested in it. If your tithe is not given willingly by faith, he doesn't need it. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Colossians 2.14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, everyone say requirements, that was against us, which was contrary to us. Everyone say contrary. He has taken it out of the way. Having nailed it to the cross. Stop. Let's go back to Hebrews 7.18. We said there was an annulling. Did you see that word? What's the meaning of the word annulling? It's a Greek word, apathesis, which means, listen, cancellation from a root. From a root word that means to set aside. It means cancellation. It comes from a root word. That means to set something aside, to disesteem, to neutralize or violate. So he neutralized and set aside the former commandment. He neutralized it. So Jesus came and neutralized the law. He set aside. Now, that looks holistic, but then you look at Colossians. Are you following me, church, please? I'm taking this step by step so you get it. Are you, uh, when you move to Colossians 2.14, we get a closer picture of what exactly Jesus annulled and neutralized in the former commandment. So did Jesus come and completely wipe away the entire law? There were some things in the law that spoke about him. So he couldn't have done that. There were some parts of the law that pointed to him. He wouldn't have done that. So what exactly was annulled? What was set aside? What was cancelled? So that a, a better hope could come in. Colossians 2.14 makes it clearer to us. It says he wiped out the ordinances... Or, or the handwriting of requirements. That was what? I can hear you. Against us, which was what? Contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way. 
Having nailed it to the cross, requirement there is the word dogma, which is law, decree, or ordinance. What ordinances and decrees did he remove? The ones that were contrary to us. In other words, he came and seized the bad ones, took them out, nailed them to the cross, and left the good ones. Because the Ten Commandments, he basically compressed into two commandments. You will love the Lord your God, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. You shall not murder. Is this still not valid? You shall not covet. Is this still not valid? That wasn't against you. That was to help you. But he summarized it and says, look, all those commandments basically are two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. That was not against us. Are you following me, church? But the ordinances that were against us, he said, enough is enough. The training is over. The school of Christ has come. We don't need this governess anymore. Now the question is, what does it mean for something to be contrary to you? That word contrary is the word hupernantios. That means under, contrary, opponent, adversary, against. Follow me. Hupo. Nantius. The enantius part is where you get the contrary antagonistic. Watch this. Where does the hoopo part come from? I said under. What do you think about under? Huh? It gives, listen, listen. It gives a picture of something that was sneaked in covertly. Under. So something was there before. And an extra thing was sneaked in, brought in. So what did he do? Those things that were sneaked in, he took them out and nailed them to the cross. One of the things that was brought in was this mandatory, you do or die component where the tithe was concerned. It was contrary to us. The tithe itself was not contrary to us because it began from the beginning as an expression of the blessing. But people were stubborn. People like Jacob thought they could negotiate with God where the tithe was concerned. And the law came. And not just the tithe. Every part of the law was a schoolmaster to train you. You can't murder. You can't commit adultery. You can't steal. And yeah. How many will you keep? It was snuck in. Hoopo. A secret adversary. Looks like a good package, but it was snuck in. And then the school of Christ came and says, I'm taking away those things that are contrary to us. There are many reasons why I can prove to you. I don't like using that word proof. I can tell you and submit to you that the tithe was not among those things contrary to us that Jesus nailed to the cross. I can give you four reasons. Reason number one, simple reasons why the tithe was not contrary to us. So he abolished certain parts of the law that had sneaked in on us. Number one, the tithe was introduced before the law. So it can't be contrary to us in the law. It was already there. Can I have that slide, please? It was already there before the law. The tithe, I'm giving you four reasons why the tithe was not among those things Jesus nailed to the cross. It was there before the law anyway. We've seen that. So he didn't nail it in the law. He nailed the contrary elements of the law. Second reason, the tithe honors a God who is still possessor of heaven and earth. After the law, did God hand over 
and say, I'm no longer possessor of heaven and earth? Did he? So does the owner steward principle still carry weight after the law? Talk to me, church. Yes. Certainly does. Certainly does. So if God is still possessor of heaven and earth, and the tithe is hinged to the owner steward principle, then the tithe cannot be one of the things Jesus nailed to the cross because the tithe still honors a God who is still possessor of heaven and earth. That has not changed. Third reason, the tithe was a principle set forth for us right from the Garden of Eden to Adam and shown to Abraham the father of faith, the progenitor of not just the Jews naturally, but for all of us who are children of faith. So the tithe was given to the father of faith. And we are called children of this man of faith, supernaturally. We are supernatural Israel. And the tithe was given to this father of faith. The tithe could not have been abolished by Jesus Christ. And the fourth reason... It was a principle God knew we could keep if we chose to because he had empowered us to do so. Remember, he blessed Adam and then he said to him, all of this is yours, but don't touch that tree. Don't eat rather of that tree, not don't touch. And we'll see why that's important later. Don't eat of that tree. So God knew we could tithe. God knew we could respect him. And God empowered us to do so. But God did not take away the power of choice. If you choose to obey God and choose to honor him as possessor of heaven and earth, you are actually able to do so because God has given you the ability by the blessing to honor him. Anyone who gets that, shout hallelujah. Glory be to God. So I believe what was taken out in the law was the school teacher mandatory component of the, ty- of the law. The school teacher mandatory component, the requirement, do this or else I punish you. I believe that was what was abolished. Because that was never God's way of doing things. God wants you to love him and do it by faith. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for liberation. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. These two scriptures will take it home for you. Galatians 2. Are you still writing? One one more minute to write, and then we'll move to Galatians 2, 19 to 21. Galatians 2, 19 to 21. Galatians 2, 19. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How do you live your life now? By faith. How do you live your life now? How do you receive your healing? How do you walk in abundance? How do you pay your tithe? Everything is by faith. The life I now live, I live by faith. I'm now in the school of Christ. 
I'm no longer under the schoolmaster and the governess who has to beat me. I'm old enough now to know what to do and live by faith. Amen. Galatians 3, 10 to 14. Galatians 3, 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Notes verse 11 and 12 now. Listen very well. Go on, 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God Again. is evident. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. Again. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. So next, how is one justified? For the just shall live by faith. Why? Verse 12. Yet the law is not of faith. Again. Yet the law is not of faith. Again. Yet the law is not of faith. Then we jump to 13. But the man who does them shall live by them. 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Go on. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Listen now. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit. How? Through faith. How? Through faith. How? Through faith. The law is not of faith. How are you justified? Can the law justify you? Can you please God under the law? Can you get it right under the law? How does God want you to live? But Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Can we therefore say? Listen, that incorporated, listen, in the curse of the law is living a life void of faith and thus an inability to please God no matter how hard you try. Part and parcel of the curse of the law is an inability, it is impossible, an inability to please God. You live a life empty of faith, yet the law is not of faith. Yet that's, that's a curse, man. When you live a life void of faith, but when you enter the school of Christ, the first thing you get is a measure of faith. Woo! You didn't get that. You have lived a life void of faith. You step into the school of Christ. He deals you the measure of faith. Then you begin to use that faith, grow that faith. It takes faith to have a salary of 2,000 naira, have needs of 10,000, and happily, willingly turn back 200 naira to the possessor of heaven and earth. You must believe. Like the Bible says, he that comes to God must believe that God is who God says he is. If God says he is possessor of heaven and earth, then this 200 naira won't solve my 10,000 naira problem. I have faith that this possessor can balance me more than that. And we found out we are on a journey to understand two legal paths to increase. And one of them is the owner's steward principle. That's the entry level. Are you following me, church? So incorporated in the curse of the law. Without Christ, you are void of faith. You cannot please God. That's why all these churches that are not born again, they call themselves churches, they can wear big gowns, carry big crosses. There's no, God is not pleased. If you like wear a big white robe, have a triangular hat on your head, have a big chain, it means nothing to God. He that comes to God must first of all believe that God is. God is what? Possessor of heaven and earth. Healer of your body. Provider of all your needs. Lover of your soul. So the first step to receiving from God is knowing God. Who does God say he is? Meditate on who God says he is. Who is a father? What does that mean? 
Things flow from God to you when you know who God is. Thank you, Jesus. So incorporated in the curse of the law is living a life void of faith. Empty, you can never please God under the law. So that's tithing under the law was the commandment. But Jesus came, removed the contrary parts, but tithing remained because the law did not introduce it. Next phase, we're looking at tithing, a timeless principle. In the church transition, did Jesus have anything to say about tithing? In the church transition, we've looked at Garden of Eden, Abraham, Jacob, in the law. Now let's look at tithing in the church transition. I call it transition because really technically, at the time Jesus walked the face of this earth, it was still the Old Testament. Technically. The church was born at resurrection. Are you following me, church? But Jesus was at transition. He was beginning to speak about a kingdom that was coming, speak about a church that was about to be born. So though technically it was still the Old Testament, we like to call it the transition period. So in that church transition, did Jesus say anything, anywhere about tithing? And what exactly did he say? And why did he say what he said? Matthew 23, 23. Should I continue? Matthew 23, 20, yes. Matthew 23. What to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. That's the New King James Version. Jesus speaking. Woe to you. Someone reads, woe to you for you pay tithe. And they say, Jesus said woe to those who pay tithe. No, what did he say? Woe to you for or because you pay tithe of this, 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 and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. English language students, is the woe for paying tithe or the woe for neglecting? Huh? To make it clearer, look at it from the, from the, the Living Bible translation. Yes, woe upon you Pharisees and you other religious leaders and hypocrites. For you tithe down to the last mint leaf in your garden. In other words, you follow the law. But you ignore the more important things. Justice and mercy and faith. Yes, you should tithe. Huh? Yes, you should tithe. But you shouldn't leave the more important things undone. Who was speaking there? Huh? Jesus. So what was he saying? What was he saying? Was he condemning the tithe? Was he disapproving the tithe? Was he annulling the tithe? What did he call, listen, 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 listen. What did he call the other matters? Huh? In other words, the tithe is there for what? Obelife. Small matter. A light matter. Amen, church. If he says, this weighty matters, you have ignored. Yes, tithe. But comparatively, the tithe is a small matter. Why are you making a big deal about a small, a small matter? Of course you should, you should tithe. Are you the possessor of heaven and earth? Why won't you tithe? Your mates are writing PhD. You are struggling with kindergarten. That's what Jesus was saying. Tithe is entry level exam for a Christian. Tithe is kindergarten finances class. Tithe is the nursery of the anointing for money and breakthrough financially. Tithe is not even primary school exam. 
that you struggle with tithe is like an adult unable to pass kindergarten exam. That's what Jesus was saying. What matters is faith, mercy, the love of God, understanding the deeper things of God. How can we be here talking about tithing? How can 10% be a problem for you? When God wants you, to, wants you to finance the kingdom, you can't pay your tithe. That's why there was a schoolmaster to get you to pass basic exam so you can be promoted to higher colleges. That's where everybody who is a member of TCC should be operating. You cannot be struggling with kindergarten entry-level exam. Glory be to God! That's what Jesus was saying. Tithe was a light matter. Wasn't a big deal. It was an entry-level exam. But it didn't guarantee you graduation. It just guaranteed you promotion to the next level. How do you want to walk in the depth of revelation of God if you struggle with accepting God as possessor of heaven and earth? Those people who argue against time are the most stingy people I've met. I'd like to see you Say, why can't my tithe be 5%? Five, five I'm not under the law. I can tithe what I want. Oh, yeah, tithe what you want. Tithe 50%. Oh, yeah, now tithe. Call it tithe. Even to write a check. Some of those guys have never seen one check as a gift. It's just an excuse to make yourself the landlord when you are but a steward. Entry level exam. Decide that today you pass kindergarten, clean your bum bum and move on. Drop the bottle of milk and get into real meat. I come here, I prophesy about financial explosion, the blessing exploding financially, finances. Some of you will be shouting. And you don't tight. Are you a thief? So that financial explosion, who is supposed to bring it? Me? No, Jim. Be waiting for me. It's not me bringing it. Who is bringing it? Who is he? I can't hear you. So that is out of that possession. It's out of that possession. The depths are broken up by prophecy, by knowledge. The clouds drop down the dew. Possession. So all the silver and gold, cattle on a thousand hills, belong to this possessor. He comes and says to you, I release financial explosion. Amen, but you don't tithe. Who is going to drop that thing for you? You're still in the nursery. They teach you A for apple. You say A for Amala. I heard someone say that recently. They should start that A for Apple nonsense. How many of our children know Apple? They should break it down to what they know. That's fair. I agree with that. But they say A for Apple. They say A for Balloon. Look at your neighbor and say, have you passed the exam? Are you in kindergarten? It's time for promotion. So, what was I saying? In other words, tithe is a lighter matter. Not a big deal. Like an entry level exam, like in the garden, but it's not guarantee you graduation. Second, an exam, you expect, listen, listen. That's what Jesus was telling them. This is an exam you're expected to pass without making noise. You pay your tithes, so. Okay, so.
I've told you, I don't, I don't check account too. I don't check. Sometimes people come here and testify of how they gave huge seed sacrifices as steps of faith. And those testimonies are good. That's when I know they gave it. Months may have passed. I did not know. Sometimes I'll see increase now. Ask the ladies. It's recently I started telling them. Ladies be telling me sometimes when there's a significant increase so I can plan for it. Not so I can celebrate the person. Okay, so you pay your tithe, so. How many of you, if you graduated from a PhD, would throw a party? Well, recently some of you did. It's okay, right? Huh? Isn't it kind of normal? Even first degree. Even first degree was celebrating. Hello. I mean, when my first daughter graduated, it was, ah, great. I'm looking forward to Tracy's PhD graduation very soon. I'm going to go for it. It's just some... Some exam you celebrate. How many of you true party when your child passed kindergarten? Is he coming home? How many of you close road when your child passed nursery? Everybody come on, my child passed nursery. It's like from first degree. Even why sometimes you don't even celebrate like that. That's what Jesus was saying. It's entry level. It's not something you should make noise. We shouldn't be spending time teaching and arguing about tithe. It's foolishness. Like there are deeper things. Leroy Thompson talks about money missionaries. I want to raise money missionaries here. Money missionaries. That's what we should be talking about. People who have who money, you don't leave protocols, but your money goes on the mission. You're a missionary, evangelist of money. That's what I want. Where your money can put us on television in France and translate French into French, just with your money. Europe is that continent. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not, it's not America, Africa anymore. Europe is a dark continent. They need the light from here. That's what we should be talking about. Not throwing party for no class graduation. So it's not something you should make noise about. Just do it quietly. Compare your tight. Third, I've said that already. We need to easily breeze through this entry level exam and seek deeper with your things. So, three reasons or three things Jesus said. Do the light matter? It's not a big deal. You should make noise about it. And from there, the starting point for deeper, weightier, more important things. May the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. To understand who God is and to know him and honor him as possessor of heaven and earth. May you have revelation that the tithe is not money. The tithe is a principle. And that principle is called the owner-steward principle. It's a timeless principle. Garden of Eden, Abraham, Jacob. Now we've seen it in the church transition. Jesus. When we pick up this message again in a few weeks, we'll continue from here. We'll look at in the time of Paul. And we'll look at this man, Melchizedek, and understand who he was and why he's important to us. I believe God is taking us on a life-changing journey. Not just where our tithe is concerned, but this will actually catapult us into the kind of increase he's been speaking to us about. In this season of the blessing. Lift your hands and give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for taking care of only the contrary things. Nailing them to the cross. Thank you for everything that sneaked in covertly against us. You took them out of the way. And brought us to the school of Christ. The school of faith. 
thank you for taking away the curse of being unable to do anything by faith, no matter how hard we tried. And thank you for giving us the blessing. Just like Father Abraham, the blessing that empowers us to live by faith. For there is no faith in the law. Thank you for the measure of faith. Thank you for righteousness. Hey, thank you for liberation. Thank you for making us new species. The kind of people that never existed before. The only set of people that can please you. The only set of people. Thank you for the advantage of the blessing. Empowering us to please you. What an awesome God you are. You require us to please you. And you empower us to please you. You make it easy for us. Thank you, Jesus. The entrance of your word has brought light. It has brought revelation. And it has, it has brought people who recognize you as possessor, owner, landlord of heaven and earth. We give you praise. Lift your hands and give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you have not been tithing. The best time to act on the message is now. When you hear it, make a decision today. Don't say, Lord, I decide to tithe. Say, Lord, I decide to honor you as possessor of heaven and earth. In doing that, you will tithe. Keep this part back for me. Don't eat it. Let's start with 10%. Oh, but your faith can do more. Go ahead and do it. Because it's not so much whether it's 10% minimum or not. It is a principle. And the very word tithe is a tenth. So you start from there. That is entry level. Everyone lift their hands. For those of you who are tithers, say, Lord Jesus, thank you for revelation. I'll continue to tithe. Knowing I honor you, I worship you with my tithe. Not out of fear, but freely, with love, willingly. Just because you are possessor of heaven and earth. And you have held back nothing from me but the tithe. So I offer that to you with revelation, with pleasure. And I open the way to increase like I've never known in my life. In the name of Jesus. And all hands up still. And for those who have not been tithing, let's all still declare together. Lord Jesus, today there has been a shift. Revelation has come. I'm an obedient child. I understand now why I should tithe. You are a possessor of heaven and earth. I can't take that from you. I'll never struggle with you. You are a possessor. You are owner and I'm steward. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for holding back nothing from me. All increase comes from you. I commit today, in this season of shift, that as you increase me, I'll return my tithe to you. As an act of worship, acknowledging you as possessor of heaven and earth. Can all the liberated saints in the house give a loud shout of praise? Thank you, Jesus.